Hey, I've got some big news for you, some exciting news for you, something that's fresh, you know, off the press, so to speak. Uh, Shan and I officially now are grandparents. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for your prayers, your support, all of that. I've got, this is little Rodney Gideon. And uh, so we are just, you know, gawking over that little child, excited. Here's another picture of him again, and then also his weight, length, time, birth, and all those things. And then the far bottom left-hand corner is uh, dad and mom, and shortly after uh, delivery, baby spent a little time with mom. And then, of course, the first time that, uh, that we get to hold little Roddy Gideon. Come on, isn't that great? And I also want to... I've been telling you about the generational thing we have going of RGF. Uh, I'm a firstborn son. My son was a firstborn son. And his son is firstborn. And then my dad and then and even the dad before that. And we're all RGFs. So there are the RGFs that are still living. Come on. Uh, so today is week number three of the series uh, that we've entitled Followers Of. This stems from my trip to Jordan and Syria where I saw a symbol that was placed upon homes or told about this of homes and businesses. Uh, that symbol is actually the 14th letter of the Arabic alphabet, which stands for in uh, our English uh, letter would be the N, <clears throat> which actually represents the word Christian, uh, which is translated for them Nazarene. Uh, so pretty much ISIS would go through the land of Syria, of Iraq, of Afghanistan, and they would find out who the Christians were and place upon their business, upon their home, that symbol, which meant follower of the Nazarene. And these people, if they were lucky enough, uh, would immediately flee for their life if they were not immediately killed. So the question I have is, what price are we paying for following Jesus? And can anybody really identify you as a follower of Christ? If you would, with, stand with me, and let's read from the book of Matthew, chapter number four, and then also from the book of John, chapter number four. <clears throat> I'm going to start with verse number 18. It says, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is also called Peter, and Andrew throwing a net into the water. For they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. So it's interesting, he says, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. Jesus' whole ministry in life was revealing how to reach people. I want to go to a story now in the book of John, chapter number four, one that maybe you have heard before of the woman at the well. And I'm going to start with verse number 28. I'm going to go to the very end of the story. It says, the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring food while we were gone, the disciples asked each other. Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me, from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the vi their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many to hear his message and believe. Then he said to the woman, then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Amen. The reading of God's word. Would you hold out your hands, close your eyes, and let's pray this prayer together. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, give me the ears to hear what you want to say. 
Give me the faith to believe what you say. And give me the courage to obey what you say. It's in your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm not a fisherman. Don't claim to be a fisherman. Uh, I love to fish, though, when I go with somebody who has all of the supplies. They do it all, the hard work. And I show up, and they know what to, how to catch fish, and you catch fish. You know what I'm talking about? But I know that there's many different ways to fish. Okay, you got fly fishing. You've got just the rod and reel. You've got the cane pole. Does anybody know what a cane pole is? It's basically a stick with a you know, string on the end. Hang it out in the water and catch some fish. Um, you can go deep sea fishing. There's so many different types of bait. I got some friends that are fishermen, and it is amazing uh, the information you need to know on the time of the year, the day, you know, time of the day, you know, the type of uh, water you're fishing in, the temperature of the water, the type of fish you're going after, all the different lures and all that. There's so much to it. There's one aspect of fishing, or maybe you've heard of this, different type of fishing, uh, called noodling. Anybody heard of noodling? Uh, noodling is one of those. You get in there with the fish. Uh, if you don't know what it is, let me explain quickly. I had somebody in the church take me noodling several years back, and uh, they took me, and you get into the water. Uh, you go into places like under logs, uh, little holes in the edge of a lake or in a creek, and you dive under, and you reach up in the hole, and you feel around for something. And you hope you get a fish. And these catfish specifically are bottom dwellers, and so they just kind of lay on the bottom of the lake. And you will stick your hand, they lay there with their mouth open. You stick your hand in their mouth, they clamp down, and then you got your fish. You're the bait. And then you pull them out. How many sound, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? So I go fishing for the first time, noodling, noodling fishing. And uh, these couple of guys, uh, began to explain to me how to do it. You know, I, I say, great, got it. And they kind of dive down and they come back up and say, hey, we got a fish for you. What I didn't know is the fish they had for me was a blue cat. Blue cat is not like the rest of the catfish. They're not as docile. Most of them are very, they just lay there. Blue cat are fighters. They will fight you. And these men in the church intentionally gave me a fighting catfish. And so I didn't know about it. I just go down and I'm telling you, it, the fight was on. After what seemed like 20 minutes was probably only about 20 seconds, I come up out of the water and the catfish had won. And I found out these guys, I come up, they're laughing at me. <laughs> and then I find out what's going on. They know it's a blue cat and they sent me for a blue cat. So I kick these guys out of the church and we've been going, <laughs> you're gone, no. Actually, I really enjoyed the experience. So the, what I want to talk to you about today is fishing. How to fish for people. I think one of the first ingredients for any fisherman is a passion, is a desire. I grew up with a dad and mom who were very passionate about winning people to Jesus, fishing for people. Dad used to pray this prayer quite often at night time. He'd say, he who wins souls is wise. It's a quote from the book of Proverbs. My dad and mom actively were always reaching out to fish for people. I remember in college one time, there was this guy who uh, had a business and just randomly he would close at times, especially on beautiful spring days. And on a sign it would say closed and then a big sign said gone fishing. I don't know how he survived his business, but he would just like choose, this is a pretty day, I'm going fishing and he would close his business. What I hope today is that when you leave out of here, you go fishing and you become a soul winner for Jesus and it becomes passionate for you. And I want to look at the example that Jesus has given us and three things that he did that we can learn from. First off, Jesus was personal. He was personal. How many of you get robocalls, these random calls from business people selling stuff? How many know that they've got sophisticated on how they market themselves, right? Uh, used to, you would look at a phone call coming in, you know, like that's out of state. It's probably, you know, somebody trying to sell. So they went from calling your home number to call in your mobile number, okay? Now they go from not only having some random 816 or 866 or whatever number to now it's local numbers. So I've learned probably like you is that I'm not answering that phone unless I see a name that I know. 
If it's a random number, I'm not answering it. I've learned not to answer numbers, I answer names. When it comes to reaching people for Jesus and fishing, it starts by making people and giving them a name, not just labeling them a number. It's relational. It's being very personal. Matter of fact, in John chapter four and verse four, look what it says here. It says that he, speaking of Jesus, had to go through Samaria on the way. On the way where? He's traveled from Judea to Galilee. He has traveled now 103 kilometers. Did you get that? Traveled for four days, 21 hours of walking. And he's very intentional about an appointment that he's going to have with a woman that's left nameless, nameless in the annals of history. We just know her as the woman at the well. But trust me, Jesus knew exactly who she was, what her situation was, and was very intentional about going to meet this lady. So he shows up and meets her. And look at her response in verse number nine. Her response is, the woman was surprised. For Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus was breaking all type of taboo. Centuries taboo. He is going into Samaria when Jews avoided Samaria. He was left alone in Samaria as a Jew. Then he talks to a Samaritan. It's a woman, Samaritan. And this woman doesn't have the best of character. He even asked for her to give him a drink, which is taboo. And then to drink from what? Her cup. All of these things are taboo. But for Jesus, it's about being personal. You know, the Bible says that he is a friend of what? Sinners. People recognize him as somebody that could be very personal to those that everyone else viewed as outcast or hold at arm's length. But Jesus got right down in the middle of their lives and loved them and showed mercy and kindness to them. You see what he's doing here? Do you see how he's responding to this lady? It's interesting to me that Jesus done a couple of th few things that we need to do. He showed interest, he made an investment, and he invited her. Uh, just the interest alone is huge for people. When you show that you care, in fact, I heard this said years ago and I believe it's true. No one really cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And when you show interest in somebody, man, you just swung open the door for them to talk to you, for them to have a listening ear, for you to have a listening ear, all that. You just act, and Jesus is showing interest in this lady. <laughs> Next, he is making an investment in her. Investment of his time, of his energy, to be able to say, I'm here for you. And when you invest in somebody's life, oh my goodness, what does that do for them? How does it open up? You see, we must be intentional like Jesus. Why? To give people the eternal life that we have. One of our values at North Church is we want to love people when they least expect it and or least deserve it. I'm talking about making an investment in people. And another thing Jesus did is he invited her along the journey. Go through the pages of the Gospels and look where Jesus constantly is inviting people to leave their nets, to leave their home, leave their family, to leave their stuff. He's giving them an invitation to follow after him. And he's doing it with this woman here too. And what must we do? We must give invitation. This last week, Shannon and I spent some time at the delivery of our, uh, of our, of our grandchild uh, with a young lady named Tiffany Bruner. Uh, Tiffany was taking the uh, pictures at, at the delivery, and so she was around like all day. And Tiffany, there's a picture of her. Uh, Tiffany has been a missionary with YWAM. Uh, here she is in Honduras. Uh, she's been on that trip to Honduras uh, with her church for the last five years. She is the office director for City Church, which is our sister church in Tulsa that we help plant. And so that's what she does, okay? But a little bit of back history on Tiffany. Tiffany was raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma, raised in the Bible Belt. 
When she was 13 years of age, she was introduced to marijuana by her mother. She became a partier. She did well in school too. She goes off to college and she's planning on getting a college degree and partying all the time and enjoying life and living it up. Something interesting about Tiffany that we take for granted, she had never been into a church door in her life. Never walked into church. Oftentimes we think everybody goes to church and that is not the case, folks. Do you realize out of the 1.3 million in the Oklahoma City metropolitan area, only about 300,000 are gonna go to church? That's over a million people, a million people that need Jesus Christ and need his hope and need a church family. Let that sink in for just a moment. When she was off at college working as a hostess in a restaurant, one of the fellow workers there showed some interest in her and made an investment in her and eventually invited her to church. Gave her a card and said, I'd like for you to come to church sometime. She went to church, that lady who invested in her actually ended up leaving. To this day, she says, I don't even remember her name. She's never met her again, but she took that invite. She went to church and she found Jesus Christ. And she went from death unto life, from blind to seen. And it's changed her life and it's changed her family history. All because somebody showed interest, made an investment and gave an invite. I'm talking about personal relationship, folks. The second thing I noticed about Jesus is that he showed patience. He showed immense patience with people. Now, this past week, no, it was this past Thursday, Thursday before that, Gavin and Haley went to the uh, hospital because they were having intense tractions, uh, contractions and said, we, we, this baby may be now. So they go, they spend the evening in the hospital. Finally, the contractions begin to ease up. They send her back home and said, you go back home and then just wait. And if you do not have this baby by Monday, that's this Thursday, by Monday, then when you come into the doctor, then the doctor said, we will check you into the hospital and we'll plan on delivering this baby. Okay. So Shannon and I go up on Sunday night, stay the night with them. They go into the doctor the next morning with the plans. They're all packed up for two days in the hospital. They're going to deliver this baby and then they come back home with the disappointing news that the doctor says, no, come back Wednesday. Any ladies know what I'm talking about? So I had so many people texting, is the baby coming? Is the baby coming? When's the baby coming? When's the baby coming? When? Uh, all these answers, like, I, I don't know. And, and, you know, family members asking. And here's what I heard typically from from mamas who had delivered babies, especially even the older they are, I heard this more commonly, that had delivered babies, women that deliver babies, they, they basically were saying this same phrase, them babies gonna come when them babies wanna come. You can't rush them babies. Anyone know what I'm talking about? When it comes to fishing for people, Babies in Christ are going to come when babies in Christ come. What do we do? We keep showing interest in people. We keep making investment in people. We keep inviting people. And as we do that, then babies are going to come. You don't do that, babies are not going to come. You do that, they're going to come. Because God's going to keep working the soil and working their hearts until the Holy Spirit transforms and changes their life. Look at this verse number 16. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired from the long journey, the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Think about this for a moment. When, when is it the hardest to be patient? It's hard to be patient when you're tired, when you're hungry, when it's hot, when you're frustrated. All of these things Jesus is dealing with right here, right? He's traveled 103 kilometers Walking several days, he is hungry. He has sent in his disciples into town to bring back food because they haven't eaten much. It is very hot in the middle of the day. He is feeling probably impatience, but what does he do? He pushes aside his feelings to show patience for one lady to be very personal with her, to give her an invite to follow him. I love this. Another thing I found out that's very difficult is when you invest in somebody and they're not receiving the investment, you ever feel like, just give up? It, it requires patience. This lady here, as Jesus began to try to develop this relationship, she kept pushing off, she kept pushing back, she kept moving. You, you read the story. She's, she's just kind of like just the little things that push back. 
I, I don't know about you, but when I have somebody that I'm trying to help out and I have the answers and they don't want the help, I just want to like, forget you. I'm going to go with somebody who wants help. That's where patience comes in. And here's the truth. God was patient with you. It's his patience that leads us to repentance, the scripture says. Wow. And how, how, about, how about the disciples? Man, God was patient with them. Here they are, though, very impatient with Jesus. When they walked up after going into town and see Jesus with the woman at the well, the scripture says that they were shocked. They didn't want to be here anyway. And Jesus brought them into Samaria. And then he sees him talking to this woman who is a Samaritan, who has a bad reputation, and they're like shocked. Why is he talking to this lady? She shouldn't, he shouldn't be doing that. What is going on here? You gotta understand the Samaritans and where they fit into the picture of things in world history. You see, because the Samaritans were actually Jews originally. The Jewish people, as the Assyrians came in and they took over the northern kingdom of Israel, and Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. They came in and took off some of the best of the best of the young people. And many other people, the Syrians, began to intermarry with. And some of them were forced marriages. And get this, these are Jewish people who are forced into marriage. And years and years later, when the Jewish people began to move back in and begin to settle, you know what they did? They looked at these people with disdain and held their arms out at length and said, no, you can't be a part of us. Which is so sad, isn't it? They're just part of their blood. Come on, let's stop for just a moment, folks. Sometimes we're impatient with the people that are different from us, unlike us, or we feel like we have something against that really is founded on nothing because all of us come from the same blood. We all come from the, we bleed the same way. We're all the same way. We've got to learn to get past the religious, get past our ideas, get past what's been put into us and how we have been trained to like or dislike certain people and realize that Jesus came to die for every single person and his objective is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If anybody should understand the patience of God, Peter should, right? That dude was constantly getting on people's nerves and Jesus was patient. Notice what it says. Peter says later on this, the Lord isn't slow about his promises as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to what? Third thing I want you to write down in your notes is personal he was patient. Third thing is I want to talk about power. I want to talk about power. So Jesus asked for a drink. And this lady's like, how am I going to give you a drink? And Jesus turns around and says to her, this woman at the well who's left nameless, but Jesus knows very intimately. He says, if you knew the gift of God and if you knew who it is that's asking you for a drink of water, you would ask me for water that you would never thirst again. And then she's like, I, I don't understand. You, you don't even have a bucket to draw water from and you're saying that you can give water that I would never thirst again? And Jesus said, you can keep going back to this water and you're gonna thirst again and again, but I will give you waters that you will never thirst. It is like bubbling up springs inside of you that will come forth. And that woman says, I want that. If you can give me water like that so I don't have to go back to this well again, I don't have to be humiliated, I don't have to go through what I'm going through, I want that. And then Jesus turns on her and says these words. He says, go get your husband, which really made no sense. Go get your husband. We're talking about living water. Now you're saying, go get your husband. And the lady says, I do not have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. Actually, you've been married five times. And now the man that you're living with is not your husband. The lady says, you must be a prophet. 
kind of enlightening, isn't it? You know, he's showing his power. He's showing the power. And also, you know what he's showing her? He's showing her what she's really thirsty for and reveals her thirst and says, that's not your answer. Her thirst was for men. And I'm not talking about for men for sex. Most likely it had nothing to do with sex, men. It probably had more something to do with security, protection, providing in a culture where it was absolutely essential that she has a man. Do you get it? And so that man represented everything for her, represented food on the table, represented clothes on her back, represented a home over, roof over her head, represented all those things. But Jesus has reminded her, that's not what you need to be thirsty for. But you may want to write this down. What you are most thirsty for is what's going to have the most power over you. Think about that. What is driving your thirst? What does it feel like that you need to have more of? What does it feel like you're missing? You know what? That's what's going to drive you and that's what's going to have power over you. And what you must realize is what Jesus is telling her. No, I can give you waters that you will never thirst again. That you'll never have to say, i got to have a man. i got to have more money. i got to have a better paying job. I've got to have that drink. I've got to have that shot. I've got to smoke that. I've got to have this. To fulfill something that's longing inside of me is not the case when you realize that life-giving water flows from Jesus above. And he's the only one that can really quench my desires and longings inside. Look at this verse, verse number 12. The lady says, besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Do you think you're greater? Now, this is the issue of power that goes, it really stretches in what Jesus is revealing to her. Is it, yes, I am greater. I, I, am, I am greater. In fact, he would say later on, I'm greater than Moses, which is you're greater than Jacob? Now you're greater than Moses? And then he would say, I'm even greater than this temple. Speaking about the temple that the Israelites would go and worship in. You see, the temple is what connected earth and heaven. It was a place where God showed up and they realized that. And Jesus said, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm connecting earth and heaven. I am that temple. Matter of fact, you can destroy this temple and in three days I will resurrect this temple. He's talking about power now. The woman switches gears and she says, well, what about where we should worship? Your people say Jerusalem. My people say at Mount Gezerim. Which mountain should I operate, worship in? In Jerusalem or this mountain? You know what she's turning? She's turning into a political issue now. Sometimes we will do that, won't we? We also make it a political thing. We're gonna, and Jesus is like, no, you gotta understand what I've come to do. The real issue is not at this mountain or in Jerusalem because I'm seeking true worshipers that will worship in spirit and in truth. And the day is coming and now is here, has arrived when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth because God is spirit. Do you get what he's saying here? He's talking about a power and the living water is actually the spirit of God that was going to live inside of her that would make her a new creation in Christ Jesus. That woman bought into it. Even the example of her leaving her water park to go into the city is a symbol of what she left behind to now chase after Jesus. And what did she do with that new noise, news? She brought other people to Christ. What are we supposed to do with what's been given to us? Bring other people to Jesus Christ. Have you gone fishing lately? Maybe now's the time. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Spirit of God. Now do your thing, Lord. Have your way. If you're here and you need Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
The scripture says that if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. Jesus said these words. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. It's not about your works. It's not about how hard you can do it. He said, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. It's about by faith, placing your trust in Jesus and choosing to follow him. Now's the time. This is the moment for you to choose to humbly follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that your spirit floods hearts now and draws people to you. Do what I can't do. Do what only you can do. And God, ignite something in us today that we want to go fishing and bring people to you. In Jesus' name, amen.